Hi professor, I hope that this video is finding you safe and well. Tonight I'm excited to talk to you about leaky gut syndrome and my research over the past few months in regards to this disease. So pretty early on in my paper, I defined a few key terms because from what I discovered, experts actually don't really like to call it leaky gut or leaky gut syndrome. And when you do a brief Google search, you notice right away that there are very little to no resources, credible resources that call it leaky gut. Uh, and I did have to do a little bit more in depth searching and most of my results and the materials that I used for this paper uh, referred to it as impaired intestinal permeability or intestinal hyperpermeability. And the reason for this is because intestinal permeability is a normal function of the intestinal barrier. So to call it leaky gut might be somewhat misleading because there needs to be a degree of pliability in the intestine for the passage of nutrients and fluids through the intestinal barrier uh, to support our overall nutritional status uh, and fluid balance in the body. So to call it leaky gut might be misleading and I established that pretty early on in my paper. I do say that when I'm discussing the normal barrier function that I'm calling it intestinal permeability and that when I'm discussing the impaired function of, I do call it leaky gut or I call it intestinal hyperpermeability just to kind of uh, <clears throat> set things uh, clearly from, from the start. So intestinal hyperpermeability is a disease or a secondary disease that has the possibility or the potential to lead to systemic chronic inflammatory disease. And increasing evidence suggests that that might actually be the case for several diseases, including type one diabetes, systemic lupus erythematosus, and multiple, scler multiple sclerosis. Uh, and Surprisingly enough, there were many, many diseases and conditions that you know we've been learning about in this program in which increased intestinal permeability was observed within. We're not at that point yet where we can say, okay, these diseases are caused by, uh, but we can definitely correlate increased intestinal permeability with many, many diseases, um, a lot of which are epidemics in the world when it comes to uh, diabetes and obesity and metabolic diseases. But we're not quite at the point where we can, uh, we can dictate causation. However, uh, what is very clear is that a poor diet, uh, as well as other environmental stimuli, including chronic alcohol and drug use, uh, stress, uh, perhaps genetic predisposition, that those environmental stimuli could potentially alter the normal permeability of the, in, of the intestinal barrier. And one of the biggest culprits of this is a Western style of eating or the standard American diet, a diet that's high in saturated fats, refined carbohydrates, and ultra-processed foods. And those specific food molecules can negatively impact the normal function of the intestinal barrier on a physical, microbial, and immunological basis. And I'm noticing, I noticed throughout my research that it's a little unclear what might happen first. You know, does the chicken come before the egg or does the egg come before the chicken? But from what I'm understanding or what I'm seeing is that it's suspected that food, poor diet, can negatively alter the gut microbiota uh, by decreasing the amount of healthy strains 
um, by decreasing the overall count of healthy microbiota in the lumen, um, as well as negatively influencing the tight junction and adherence junction proteins in the paracellular space and between the intestinal enterocytes. Uh, and that seems to be what has this permissive effect on the cascade of events that occurs when there is an increase in intestinal permeability uh, or when leaky gut seems to be becoming uh, apparent. So what ends up happening is the decrease in good bacteria has a permissive effect on the proliferation of more toxic bacteria, which can also produce endotoxins such as lipopolysaccharide, which is an inflammatory byproduct, uh, that can wear at the elasticity of those tight junction proteins in the paracellular space, causing a flux of luminal contents that we don't necessarily want to pass through the paracellular space in between the enterocytes. And this is a direct passage from the lumen straight into the the submucosa where we are the lamina propria and the submucosa where we have uh, lymphoid tissues and when we have this flux of unwanted material going into those tissues we see the beginnings of an inflammatory response and it's a vicious cycle it just continues uh, and it can cause chronic low-grade inflammation in the intestinal tract which has the ability to of course uh, extend up into our hepatic detoxification systems and which also has a permissive effect on overall systemic inflammation and uh, if I'm not mistaken genetic predisposition does have an influence on how an individual will respond to that systemic inflammation, uh, whether that's through, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or perhaps multiple sclerosis or even Alzheimer's disease has been associated with, with intestinal permeability. A genetic predisposition will determine how that d disease will progress in, in that individual. So, it's very clear that nutritional intervention, I mean, it's a no-brainer to me. It should absolutely be first-line intervention when it comes to addressing a leaky gut. And the one thing that I really found challenging with this research paper and my topic was that you have to look at intestinal permeability from a chronic disease standpoint and leaky gut influences all of these different chronic diseases so to say okay this is going to be you know the treatment for leaky gut you can't say that you know this is going to work for diabetes this is going to work for rheumatoid arthritis this is going to work for chronic fatigue syndrome uh it's to my belief that different chronic diseases, different diseases, different conditions will have uh, different nutritional requirements. So that I found really challenging. Um, however, if we are just looking at it from a nutritive standpoint on the intestinal barrier function, things can things are quite clear. And it's also extremely clear that if we use or if we have these healthy uh, eating habits that we are consuming a whole foods diet, and I reference the Mediterranean diet or Mediterranean style of eating in my paper because of uh, because it's just such a widely studied dietary pattern that shows great efficacy in reducing overall inflammation. And it's just very clear that when you look at it from that perspective that we can possibly prevent disease progression, period, as long as perhaps we are respecting, you know, ourselves with the with the uh, proper food. So, so a few key nutrients that I was able to identify in the support of normalized intestinal barrier function is vitamin C, 
vitamin E, vitamin D and calcium, zinc, and polyphenols, uh, specifically flavonoids such as uh, quercetin. And of course there are other really important nutritional components to intestinal health. And that was really challenging for me to not talk about in this paper because I do know that substances like glutamine are super important and short chain fatty acids. So it was really interesting as well as of course, uh, prebiotics and probiotics. So it was really challenging looking at this from just a, a micronutrient standpoint. But uh, so there are other nutrients and components that we can use nutritionally to help influence positive, uh, to help influence or improve intestinal health. But specifically related to intestinal barrier function and uh, immune response, these vitamins seem to be discussed the most in research. And uh, I'd also like to mention that there were no doses, recommended doses for these vit for these micronutrients uh, in relationship to just intestinal health. I would have had to, you know, pick several chronic diseases to discuss in order for me to determine dosing. But for just intestinal health as a whole, there's really not a whole lot of information out there. So, you know, having gone through this myself a couple of years ago, um, the most important piece of it was initially to adjust diet, uh, remove foods that could exasperate your, could exasperate symptoms, right? Uh, and then second was to, of course, uh, implement probiotics and eat prebiotic fermented foods to get the microbiota, you know, thriving. And then, of course, once you've kind of eliminated that inflammation, it, I would imagine that the intestinal barrier is able to regrow and regenerate as it's supposed to, you know, every, you know, three to five days, you know, that it goes through that shedding proliferation cycle. So... Uh, I just thought that that was really interesting, and I would imagine that that we would probably come to a conclusion at some point in the future that uh, there are specific nutritive uh, actions that we can take in overall intestinal health to ensure that we are not progressing into a greater disease state. Uh, and I think that the nutritional assessment definitely is important. Uh, I know it's of course important with the analysis of, of, of any person's nu nutritional risk uh, or nutritional status, but especially for this, because it would be so individualized depending upon what disease, you know, we are, we're dealing with. So getting a full nutrition, a full nu thorough nutritional assessment would certainly help determine what we can do from a nutritional standpoint, what assessments would be appropriate for us to uh, recommend or order for that person to go through, uh, you know, whether it, you know, the biochemical uh, labs that we could, uh, put, that we could use to assess overall nutrient status. And all of that really plays a role in how we would individualize a treatment and care for a person with leaky gut. So I think that that about wraps it up in a little bit less than 15 minutes. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoy my paper and my video, and I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you.